Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a, a beautiful fall day. I love seeing the colors, and uh, I think it's going to be actually a little bit cooler this week, too. So let's enjoy this beautiful time of year. I want to start us off this morning with some verses from the letter of Paul to the Philippian church. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This morning we have a great opportunity to uh, hear from and to pray for some people that have been a part of the work of this church for a long time. Stephen Christie, if you would join me up here. Steve and Christy are international workers who are supported by and sent out by our church. And if you would just remind us, uh, Christy, of your association with the church from a long time ago. Sure. Good morning, church family. And you are my church family. Uh, for those of you who might not know this, I grew up here at First Alliance Church. I started attending with my family when I was just a little girl. And I accepted the Lord here when I was eight. And when I was nine, I felt my call to overseas ministry. And then I was baptized, and I was discipled in the youth program here, went off to study at Toccoa Falls College and met Steve, and then he and I were married here at First Alliance Church. And back in 2000, you commissioned us to the field, and so for us, it's a delight and a joy to be back with you today, to have you send us again now for our fifth term overseas. So why don't you remind us what you've been doing for the last 20 years? You have 20 seconds. All right. <laughs> Oh, well, good morning. Uh, because we serve in a place that's considered creative access, uh, Scott didn't use our last names, and we won't talk about exactly the names of the countries where we've served or where we'll be moving to. But many of you already know that, Lord willing. Uh, and so we have served, as he said, since the year 2000 overseas in the North Central Asia region, and we've been involved mainly in church planting and discipleship and leadership development and, and field leadership on our field. Uh, we now are, as you might know, transitioning and we're moving only 500 miles away, but it's to another country and to another capital city in the neighboring country that share a pretty hostile border right now. And we're gonna be doing a lot of the same things, although for this next year, we're gonna be the only alliance workers in the country. We only have one other couple in the country and they are on home assignment this year. So we'll be there and we'll be doing church planting. We'll be working with leaders and, um, and in our two small churches there. But there are 20 other churches that want to join our work. 20 other churches in, part of the, uh, in another part of the country. And so if that all comes together over this next year, that would, Lord willing, be the Christian, become the Christian Missionary Alliance of that country. So that's a lot of what I'm going to be involved in. Uh, and Christy has some exciting things that she's going to be involved in, too. As many of you know, all my background and training is in counseling psychology. And one of the things that I've been doing since we've ba been back in the U.S. is I finished my doctorate in, in psychology and have been pursuing licensure as a clinical psychologist. When we return, I'm excited to announce that my new ministry, I'm going to be opening a counseling respite center for international workers who need a place to come to rest and receive counseling. So that's just a joy for me to be thinking about and planning for and to ask you to join us in praying about uh, because it's a new endeavor and one that we feel is really needed. And then... Uh we are going to be praying for them, so we want you to share some prayer requests. I'm going to ask the, uh, the staff, the pastors, and the elders to join us. Uh, why don't you share with us some uh, prayer requests? Mm -hmm. So as we mentioned, uh, we'll be headed back, and uh, you might not know, but all of our children are now grown adults. Our sons are married, and our daughters-in-law, and um, now we have two grandchildren. We're leaving them all behind, including our dog, too. And so this is a new transition for us to go back as empty nesters and leave behind all of our family. And especially for me as a mom and a grandma, this is new for me and, and really hard, actually. 
And where we're headed back, we, like Steve said, will be the only Alliance workers in that country for at least a year. And that's something else that's new for us because we've always ministered together in team. So we ask that you would pray for us, especially in this first year back. Just two more requests briefly. Because we are moving from one country to another, uh, but didn't really know that when we left uh, for home assignment, all of our things, all of our personal items are still back where we've served. Uh, and because there's a hostile border, because of COVID, we have no idea how we're going to get our things from one country to the other country. And so if you could be praying for that as we try to figure that out. Uh, in addition, the country where we're moving to just a month ago shut down their borders uh, because of COVID again and said just for September till, till tomorrow, September 28th. We already had tickets for two weeks from now, 16 days from now uh, out of Atlanta. And so, uh, but numbers have continued to kind of skyrocket there over the last four weeks. So we're not sure. They haven't come out and said yet, are they reopening or are they extending their closure, their border closing? So uh, we just request prayer for that, especially in these next two days. We're just, we're packing as though we're leaving, but we know it's probably 50% chance we might be delayed. And so that kind of just, it kind of tends to uh, cause you to feel a little bit of instability in that, uh, not knowing what this next month holds or what these next two weeks hold. So that's uh, a matter of prayer for us. Great. Before we go to prayer, I just want to say if you would like to uh, speak with Stephen Christie before you leave today, uh, maybe just to introduce yourself or just to catch up a little bit or maybe to be added to their newsletter, you can meet them outside the exit under that overhang, and they will spend a little bit of time there uh, if you would like to talk to them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do lift up this precious couple to you, and we thank you for their willingness to dedicate their lives to taking the gospel to those who have not heard, uh, who have not responded. And even knowing that this time is much more difficult than ever before, leaving all of their children and their grandchildren behind. Father, we pray that you would make this as easy as possible, that the memories would be sweet. And we thank you for technology that makes it um, more easily able to connect and even to see as their grandchildren grow. Father, we pray uh, for this new location and new ministry that uh, you would go before them that you would bless their work, and especially as they are working alone for a period of time, that that would not become discouraging or difficult. And Father, we pray for uh, their physical stuff that they had to leave behind in another country, that you would work out a way for that to get to them where they are. And also, as they look to uh, travel, not knowing whether or not they will be leaving in two weeks or a month or even uh, a different time altogether. Give them patience, uh, allow them to see that your timing is best. And Father, we pray that it would be um, as smooth of a travel time as possible. Please flood their lives with your grace and with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying with us and would you stand as we continue our time of worship.
not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You
Would you pray with me? Lord, you are good. It is that simple. You are good and you love us. We give you all the praise and all the glory for all that you've done, for all that you are, for loving us, for wanting us to be with you. Praise you this morning, Lord. We are thankful and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, First Alliance Church family. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Pastor DeAndre, and I have the privilege of being your youth pastor. Uh, now, something I do not have the privilege of being is the firstborn in my family. Any firstborn children out there, raise your hand. Firstborn children, ni nice and high, be proud of this, right? Now, take that same hand and smack yourself in the middle of the forehead, because that is honestly how I feel about firstborn children. I'm, I'm just kidding, only, only a little bit. See, the problem is, I have four siblings. I have a two older brothers who are much bigger than me, and I've got two younger sisters who are almost bigger than me. You know, and I, I, was, I was a middle child, and it was not the best at some times. Um, I remember when I was the youngest, I was always the smallest. I remember a time always being the smallest. I remember a time of being the one that couldn't do this and couldn't do that. And then I remember a time of being the one that had to do everything because my older brothers were out of the house and my two younger sisters were too young to do anything. But eventually it got better because my mom announced that she was going to have another kid. And I said, this is my chance. This is my opportunity to have a little brother that I get to beat up and not include in anything. This is my chance. And then she had a girl. And I was like, Mom, you, you had one job. But that's okay. Because a few years later, my mom then announced that she was going to have a, another kid. And I said, I forgive you, Mom. This is your chance to make up for your past mistakes. We need a boy this time. And then she had another girl. So that's how I ended up with two older brothers and two younger sisters. And I said, you know what, Mom? You failed me. So when I grow up and I have my own children, I'm going to have my firstborn is going to be a son, and he is going to be just like me. So I want to introduce you to my firstborn daughter. Her name is Isabel Elise. She is just like me. She likes big trucks, lasagna, sloppy joes, and she likes talking to people. Uh, she's extremely smart. She's independent. And she has a fierce personality and she is beautiful. But she gets those things from her mother. Now, before Isabel was born, man, I wanted a son so bad. But then the Lord, he blessed me with a daughter. I said I would do absolutely anything for that girl. But one day, I have to give that girl away. This will be the worst day of my life. So I've already started preparing for it. Now, some people, they call me dramatic. But if it's your son... You'll thank me that I'm preparing right now in this moment. So when this bum, I mean, I'm sorry. When this young man approaches me to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage, which he will do, there are some qualifications, right? Some of these are necessities and some of them are just perks. For example, it may help this young man if he approaches me beforehand, for, before even dating my daughter, if he asks for my permission. Right? That, that shows respect and maturity. Uh, he should be well-dressed, and he should take care of himself. Bonus points if he drives a cool car but doesn't break the speed limit. Okay? And he might get on my good side if he drops off a, a pair of season tickets to the Steelers. Right? Get on my good side there. You'll get on my bad side if it's the Patriots or the Browns. Just helping you out. I want him to have hopes and dreams. I want him to be ambitious. But most of all, and first, I want him to love Christ. And then he will know how to love my daughter. Because if he can do these things, if he loves Christ, and he knows how to love my daughter, this will tell me that he has a good foundation. Now, all of those other things, including the Steeler tickets, they're okay. But if you love Jesus, and my daughter loves you, those are big qualifications in receiving my blessing and being accepted into my family. 
But enough about my family. Let's talk about God's family for a second. But before we do that, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you. I thank you for blessing me with the family that I do have. I thank you for blessing me with my daughter. Father, I thank you for loving the world so much that you gave your one and only son. That whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Holy Spirit, I thank you for residing inside of me, residing inside of all believers. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that was willingly shed on the cross that brought us reconciliation with our Father. Holy Spirit, this time belongs to you. May you do with it as you please. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Foundations are good, right? When you're going to build or going to buy a house, you want something with a good foundation, right? That's kind of part of the qualification before you buy a house or when you start building a house. you got to build that foundation first. A good friend of mine, Jared Hedrick, and I, we went out looking for houses for my family to buy or renovate. And, you know, I'm new to this, so I took Jared with me. And, you know, I thought I found a good house. And Jared looks at me and he says, you don't want that house, man. It's got a bad foundation. So we turned the other way and started looking for something else. Foundations are good. Well, today we're going to find uh, and read a few verses together that I believe in a very strong way is Paul bringing to light some really important understandings that we as Christians need and should have built the foundation of our faith on. I believe this is answered throughout the entire book of Colossians, and I'd like to bring a couple of verses to the table, but specifically I feel pulled to take a close look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Now, I believe that while reading through the book of Colossians, we see that Paul and Timothy give this Colossian congregation a reminder. And this reminder is that there is a qualification to be in God's kingdom. Our author then reminds this church in Colossae that they already have that qualification. They have already accepted that qualification, and you just need to be reminded of that qualification. And this reminder of this qualification, I believe, is found in verses 15 through 23. And it should be, and it needs to be, the foundation of their faith and the foundation of their church. And this is what those verses read. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven in which I, Paul, have become a servant. Like I mentioned before, I believe in a very strong way that Paul brings to light some really important things. And as believers, these things should remind us of what we build our foundation on. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. But before we really get into those verses 15 through 23, I feel like it's extremely important for us to have an understanding of the history of the church of Colossae. And I feel like Paul does a great job of summing that up in the first 15 verses. And we just don't have enough time to read through them and go through them. So I'm just going to summarize them for you guys. Now, in Colossians chapter 1, it helps us understand that both Paul and Timothy, they were kind of writing this letter to this church in Colossae. They were writing this letter together. See, in verse 2, he says that they're writing to the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. So this tells us that Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to Christians, people who believe in Jesus. So we know who this letter, this letter was written by, and we know who this letter was written to. Paul and Timothy begin their letter by giving thanks to God because they heard a rumor of this church's faith in Jesus and the love for God's people. This church was known for two things. Faith in Jesus Christ and love for God's people. 
he then says that these, these two things, they have a source. And that source is hope. Hope in the things that are stored up for these people in heaven, not here on this earth. And because of this hope, two things kind of leap and spring forward from the hearts of these believers. And that's faith in Jesus Christ and love for God's people. And he says that this same gospel that these guys heard, this same gospel is growing in the entire world. And then Paul says that they learned this gospel from a, a man named Epaphras. Now he was a Gentile that heard the gospel from Paul in Ephesus. This guy, he told Paul and Timothy about the love that this church shares for God and his people and the Holy Spirit. When Paul hears these things, he says, Because of these things in which I have heard, we will not stop praying for you. We will continually to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And then he takes a turn. See, Paul and Timothy, they begin to remind this church that they all have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ, which allowed them to receive redemption in the forgiveness of sins. Now, these things are, these are amazing things, right? I mean, some of you are kind of like, hey, this sounds, this sounds like a really good message. Why don't you just preach on these things and we'll have a good day? Because I believe it gets better. I believe it gets really better. If you read through the book of Colossians, which if you haven't, I really, really recommend that you do because it's about four chapters. That you could probably finish it in one night. While you're reading, you're going to pick up on some things that are not just outwardly said. This could be dangerous for a lot of people, especially for a pastor who gets a bright idea to preach on these said things. But through my study of Colossians, it became pretty clear to me that this congregation was under attack. Paul didn't just hear about really good things that this church was doing and then decide to write them a letter about it. No. Paul caught wind of something. Paul caught wind of some good things and he caught wind of some bad things. David Garland wrote a commentary on the book of Colossians, and he brought to light a lot of things for me. We see that Paul mentions reference to Epaphras, right? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul is talking about the grace and truth of God that was taught to the people of Colossae by Epaphras, who was a missionary, and he had founded that church. We don't know how Paul heard of these things happening in the church. Some believe that, that Epaphras may have informed Paul about these things while they were incarcerated together, but they never tell us. All we know is that Paul heard about what was going on in the church of Colossae and decided to write them a letter. And as we read through this book, we can see that Paul could not have only heard of good things. He had to hear of some things that caused his spirit to wrestle and write these letters. And this theory, I believe, is confirmed when Paul writes in chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 20, a pretty big question. And this is what he says. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do you do not handle, do not taste, do not touch according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and aestheticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now here's why these first 15 verses are extremely important. And I can't stress enough how important it is that you guys go back and you read these if you can. Our authors wrote these first 15 verses in Colossians 1 to remind the people of Colossians what kind of church they were known to be. Paul wanted to remind these people that the reason that you are the church that you are today is because you had a foundation. And that foundation was a good foundation. But why would there need to be a reminder if that foundation was good? How many times do we walk around checking the foundations of our homes? Not every single day, but if we think something may have compromised that foundation, we go and we check. And, and that's why I believe. Paul's reminding them because there was something opposing that said foundation. And that was a Philosophy. Everybody go, philosophy. There was this philosophy that was threatening the Colossian congregation. Garland says that this philosophy is subtle. It takes the appearance of things that are sought out as good, like wisdom. 
which means that it's persuasive, it puts up a good argument, and it just simply sounds like it makes sense. This philosophy, it takes believers who are not strong in their faith, and it takes them captive. This philosophy would tend to make logical sense because of what it would at times be brought into and adopted as religious practices. This, this just makes sense to me, so it, it, it can be adopted into my religious practices. Now, anyone who did not conform to this way of thinking would receive a very hostile criticism. And this seemed to be happening in that population of churches. Now, study had shown that the opponents that were responsible for this hostile criticism are actually rival Jews. And they were attempting to convince the Colossians and that Christians, that Christianity, we are not able to find completeness in Christ alone, but only in Judaism. And this is how we got to where we are here. And this is fascinating, and I hope it's fascinating to some of you guys as well. Now, a couple of months ago, Pastor Mike, he preached on a message of Paul's conversion to Christianity. We heard that on the road to Damascus. So Paul, he becomes a believer, and he begins to evangelize and plant churches in a lot of the same places that the Jewish community settled in after the diaspora. Now, the diaspora, if you guys aren't familiar with that, you may have heard this word before, but if you haven't, the Jewish diaspora was the exiling or the, the dispersion of the Jewish population. They were removed from their homeland and they settled in other parts of the globe. Now, this is important while we work through the books of Acts together as a church. When Paul began to evangelize in Ephesus, the gospel is shared with Jews and Gentiles alike. Epaphras, who was a Gentile, he hears this gospel and brings it to Colossae as a missionary. However, not everyone accepts this gospel, especially some of the people from the Jewish population. So the church would have these informal contacts with the Jews in the city. And the contact would most likely cause a lot of friction. And here's why. The devout Jews who refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah rejected the gospel that accepted Gentiles as their co-heirs. They would not even sit next to a Gentile who in their mind pirated their scripture and stole their hopes and because these people were unqualified to have a relationship with God. Now, in response, they would push a philosophy that would be very hostile toward the Christian church that accepted Gentiles. And that philosophy was that Judaism was rational. Its laws were in accordance with nature, not against it. And Judaism also gained a reputation of wisdom for high ethical standards and of knowledge. Judaism, Judaism just made logical sense. And therefore, it was the, the superior religion. Now, these particular Jews, they used their religion in an attempt to prove that the Gentiles poisoned their true religion. So they retaliate with this logical philosophy, which would make believers, especially the Gentiles, feel unqualified to be in the kingdom of God. And see, the thing that I want us to understand today is that the enemy has been playing this same game for a very, very long time. Because Satan is unable to create, he will duplicate. He takes the form of things God had already created to be good, and then he duplicates those things and uses them against us to push his own agenda. And it's sneaky, and at oftentimes we are unable to notice it until it's too late. This is the reason that when believers are being warned about the attacks of the enemy, the metaphors that they use are very particular metaphors. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, when lions attack, they don't just start roaring from the beginning of their attack. You, their enemy would see them coming. They prowl first. It's a very sneaky action. They sit and they wait for their chance to attack. And the last thing that the person or the thing that they are attacking hears is that roar. And by that time, it's too late. How about John chapter 8, verse 44? It says, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. If we go back to Genesis, we see that to be true. Eve is in the garden, tending to the garden, and the serpent comes up to her and starts talking to her. If you're familiar with the story in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, you know that Eve and this serpent are in the garden of Eden, and they share some words. Mistake number one. 
why are you talking to a snake? I don't look at, I don't play with, and I definitely don't keep snakes as pets. But Eve is making small talk with this serpent. On much of a serious note, think about it. Why was she actually talking to the snake in the first place? Really think about it. As we read through the book of Genesis, you read God creating all things. And up until this point, the only negative thing that we read is the fact that God said it was not good for man to be alone. So he created woman, not football, gentlemen, but woman. And then he said they should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or they should, they should surely die. Up to this point, these are the two things in which are negative. So why was Eve talking to the snake? My answer is because she believed it was good. She had to. She had to believe that it was good. See, Satan, he can't create, so he did what he could do. He duplicated something that God intended to be good and used it against Adam and Eve. Why would something that God placed into the garden be evil and actually desire to lead me astray? Now, the serpent didn't slither up her body and force her to grab that fruit and, 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 and take a bite of it and then give it to her husband. He, he didn't do that. He said something to her that made logical sense. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? She responds to him, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then what did he say? You will not surely die. What happened there? It was subtle. It took the appearance of things that were sought out as good, like wisdom. Eve was out in the garden, and then she was led to this tree, and the serpent tells her something that logically makes sense. You're not going to actually die. So she believes him. Now, because we know how the story ends for Adam and Eve, it's easier for us to say, well, she should have known that this was a bad idea, right? You should have known this is a bad idea. Why would you do that? You had everything you needed, and life was good. You actually were in the physical presence of God, and you threw it all away for something that made logical sense. Because this serpent deceived you. You had everything. You were fully qualified to be in the physical presence of God, and now that's gone. Why would you do something like that? And this is how that philosophy works. This is exactly what Satan has been doing since the Garden of Eden and up until these chapters in Colossians that we are reading right now. And I believe that Paul, he asked a very similar question, the one that we kind of want to ask Eve. Why would you do that? You had everything. Why would you throw it away? He just says it a little differently. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, if you accepted Jesus Christ, you're following Jesus, you have life, you're not of this world, why, as if you were still alive in this world, do you submit to regulation? Why do you fall victim to things that have the appearance of wisdom when in fact the only thing that they do is promote a self-made religion? Paul says this is not the gospel that you heard. This is not the gospel that your foundation is based on. Now for the church of Colossae, I think it's because there was a very strong Jewish population that was using a very logical but hostile approach that forced some Christ-following churches to mold to a philosophy that was actually opposite to Christ. They were beginning to mold to a philosophy that was convincing them that Christ wasn't enough to have qualified them to be heirs of the kingdom of God. So surrounding churches began to bend and mold and backslide into practicing things that were not Christ-like. Now I ask us the same thing. What are some of the logical philosophies that we have fallen captive to? What are some uh, of the advice that we as Christians have received and maybe even given to other people? You know, the kind that makes logical sense? This makes logical sense, so it just makes sense that I just believe it. Not knowing that it is actually opposite thinking of Christ. Think about our responses to attending church in the past and think about our responses to attending church now today more than ever. 
Where are we placing our hope and our foundation? What are your motives? Is it for your safety? Because that's understandable. Or is it about proving a point? Think about our responses to wearing masks. Think about our responses when asked to give financially. Think about our responses to the things we see happening on national television. Think about the pandemic. Think about the Black Lives Matter movement. Think about the election. Think about how we treat others when we see them outside of church or the way that you treat the people that you work with. If we search hard enough, I'm sure we're going to be able to find times and experiences when we've molded to a logical philosophy that have caused us to act very, very unchristlike. Paul doesn't write a letter to the church of Colossae and tell them, it's okay, sometimes believers, people who believe in God, people who believe in Jesus, it's okay. Sometimes they, black, they backslide and they do things that they're not supposed to do and say things that they're not supposed to say, and it's all going to be okay. No. He reminds these people that the foundation of their faith was built on something stronger than a logical philosophy. Paul hears about these good things and he hears about these bad things from this church of Colossae and he writes them a letter, an attempt to remind them of the foundation in which their faith was built on. And this is why we get to the verses that we're going to go through today. Because I believe these are the verses that he uses to remind them of this foundation. And I believe it needs to be our reminder. A little before the verses that we get to, verse 13, Paul leaves off saying, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Paul says he remember, he remembers that there was a time where you were once in darkness, but you have been delivered from that place You've been brought to a new place, and that new place is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. He says, remember that. And then he continues in verse 15. He says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is your qualification. Just as some knucklehead boy will soon come to marry my daughter, my firstborn child, the image of me as her father, Jesus Christ is the firstborn over all creation. In the church, we are his bride. Your qualification is in Christ Jesus. This is your foundation. He continues, for in him all things are created, things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We're not talking about a logical philosophy that was created by man. We're talking about Jesus who was the agent of creation. He was the goal of creation. For everything was created by him and for him, for his honor and for his praise. This is your foundation. This is a foundation that cannot be shaken. This is a foundation that cannot be moved. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. This means when things get a little rocky, he is the one that will sustain you. He is the one who will prevent you from falling into chaos. He is the ultimate authority over the church, which means that he will be the one that provides sustenance. He will be the one that provides direction. He will be the one that provides wisdom. Christ will. When things get rocky, when you don't know where to go, when you don't know where to turn, you turn back to your foundation. But the logical philosophy here is that we can turn to so many different things. I'll just have one more drink. Because it just makes sense. It's a logical philosophy. It is not your foundation. Christ is. Christ is the ultimate authority over the church, which means that he will be the one that provides sustenance for you, direction and wisdom and understanding. And for here at First Alliance Church, that happens when it's sought out by our leadership. And that's what they're doing. That is the foundation of our church. This is the foundation of the church. It's Jesus Christ. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether things on, on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus not only bears God's glory, but all that God is also dwells inside of Christ. This is the foundation that we want to build our faith on. A foundation that God sought fit, that all he is and dwells inside of Jesus. He is the one that has perfect wisdom and perfect power. He was fully God and fully man, which allowed him to pave the way of reconciliation for things on earth and things in heaven. That is, that is power. That is strength. That is strong. That's a good foundation. He did that by sacrificing his own life on the cross. Christ is your foundation. Paul says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. Paul takes a directional turn here and once again reminds him that there was a time when they were separated. Not worthy, unqualified. And this was when they were alienated from God because they were Gentile. They were without God. They were without sin. They were alienated because sin results in separation from God. When a person is a non-believer, they are hostile in their mind toward God and his word. Paul told another church this in the, in the book of Romans. But he says there is the work of reconciliation that Christ was able to accomplish on the cross. You have received this. You have been made worthy of it. And now that is what is working in all believers that's presenting us holy and blameless before God. And then he says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, do not move from hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. We get a sense of expectation here. See, for me, this, this last verse indicates that Paul and Timothy fully expect that the Colossian believers will continue in their faith and not in a logical philosophy that attempts to impede on their worship. Paul is expecting that faithfulness in Christ being enough. Faithfulness in Christ being your foundation is expected. This is why he says, if you continue in your faith, Establish and firm and do not move from the hope. That same hope that I know that you have, that same hope that I know was presented to you. Now this is the same idea here as the houses on sand that Jesus mentions in the book of Matthew. Paul wanted the Colossians to continue to strive on their strong foundation that was established in them already. Not swaying to logical philosophies. First Alliance Church, the times that we are in right now, more than ever, we need to be a church that understands that our qualification to be a part of God's kingdom is already established. Christ has already won. He has already claimed the victory. We just need to be reminded of it. And once we're reminded of it, we need to stand firm and not shift from that. I hope this encourages you today. But maybe you're here. Your foundation was made with logical philosophies. And things that just simply make sense. Creation of the earth doesn't make sense to me. Jesus Dying on the cross, being fully God, fully man, just doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't logically make sense. Would you put your faith in Jesus today? Would today be the day that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and truly believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead? Don't live your life submitting to regulations that only carry the appearance of wisdom. Instead, come to the true source. Let's pray. God, if I look back through all the times in my life that 
I've tried to comprehend and understand the things that you do. I see myself spinning in circles. But God, if I look back on the times when I had nothing, I was weak, I was broken, and I needed a Savior, you were there every time. Because you were strong, you were powerful, and you were a foundation that cannot be shifted and moved, and we have been invited to build our faith on that same foundation. Father, again, I thank you for being willing to send Jesus here to die on the cross to provide a way for us to be reconciled with the God that loves us and that created us. Jesus, we thank you for being willing to die on that cross. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here with us and those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. God, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you've yet to do. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Would you stand and sing our final song with us?
Please be seated just for a moment. Thank you. Hey, if today uh, you made a decision to allow Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord, uh, would you come and just talk with me? I would really love the opportunity to pray with you and help you along in this journey. Um, but if you need prayer at all for any reason, there are elders who are here who would love to pray with you. Um, speaking of foundations, on October the 11th, uh, we as a church will be celebrating the paying off of our mortgage. Um, we would love if you would all join us, uh, and it would be extremely helpful uh, if you registered for this event by vis visiting our digital FAC weekly bulletin. You can register there. And again, we would love to have you guys join us as we celebrate this foundation that we stand on today. Um, and I thought it would be good for, uh, for us to send you guys out with the same words that Paul uses uh, in the book of Romans. Uh, so please stand for your benediction. Your benediction uh, for today comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. This is really cool. It says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be the glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Go, knowing you are loved. Thank you so much for joining us.